Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, can you hear me okay? No. Okay. How's that? Better. Better. Yeah, I can hear myself. <laughs> That's great. Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, it's my uh, great honor to welcome you to the lecture tonight, as well as introduce our special uh, guest. But before I do that, I would like to uh, make mention of a few people in the audience tonight. Uh, first, I'd like to mention that uh, Bill and Leanne McLean are here. They're friends of the Stapleford family and regular attendees of the lecture. We also have, as a special guest, uh, Dr. Michael O'Sullivan, who's a grandson of the Stapleford family, and uh, Vianne Timmons, the president of the University of Regina. We also have uh, Ralph Goodell, who's a member of Parliament, uh, Regina Scanlon, he's here this evening as well. My name is Greg Marshall, and I'm a Canada Research Chair and Professor in the Johnson Choyama Graduate School of Public Policy. And I'm also a newly minted uh, adjunct professor in the Department of History in the Faculty of Arts. And it's my great honor to be able to introduce our guest speaker. Uh, but first, let me tell you just a little bit about the Stapleford Lecture itself. The lecture honors Reverend Dr. Ernest William Stapleford, born 1874, who is widely regarded as the former president of Regina College, the precursor to the University of Regina, of course. It also honors his wife, Mrs. Maud Bunting Stapleford, born 1884, a community leader and advocate for women's and children's rights and public funding for daycare centers. The fund for the lecture was established by Dr. Elsie Stapleford, who passed away 10 years ago at the age of 95. This year, the Faculty of Arts is very pleased that Dr. Gar Gordon Barnhart will present the 2014 Stapleford Lecture. Dr. Barnhart is both a practitioner and a scholar of government, an expert, widely recognized in parliamentary and legislative processes in Canada. He was born in Salt Coat, Saskatchewan, and when he completed his uh, B.A. in History in 1967. He taught school for four whole months, <laughs> but then was lured away to become the clerk of the Saskatchewan Legislative Assembly, the youngest person to hold this position in the Commonwealth. He would remain clerk for 20 years. Somehow, he found the time to work part-time on his graduate studies, and he completed his M.A. in History at this university in 1977. In 1989, he was appointed as clerk of the Senate of Canada, and he would remain in this position for five years. And it was really this experience that laid the groundwork for what you're going to hear tonight. Dr. Barnhart then returned to Saskatchewan after his time in Ottawa and completed his PhD history from this province's other university. <laughs> in fact, his thesis would eventually be transformed into a published biography of the province's first premier, Walter Scott. Shortly before his biography, entitled Peace, Progress, and Prosperity, was published in 2000, he began yet another career <coughs> as university secretary at the University of Saskatchewan. He went on to complete other including books on the working of parliamentary committees and the construction of the Saskatchewan Legislative Building. He also edited the volume entitled Saskatchewan Premiers of the 20th Century. And he took on yet another role during these years as Lieutenant Governor of Saskatchewan from 2006 until 2012. Dr. Barnhart's lecture is about Senate reform in Canada, 
one of the hottest subjects in Canadian politics since the media revelations concerning the spending of some senators. Now, as Canadians, we've debated Senate reform in years past. There was even, as most of you will remember, a Western political movement based on the idea of a triple E Senate, equal, elected, and effective. But it's taken the recent scandal to really launch serious debate on the issue in the rest of the country. If Dr. Barnhart had tried to make this presentation before the Senate scandal, he would have had to entitle it Senate Reform. Who really cares? <laughs> well, we care now. Dr. Barnhart addresses two key issues tonight. Is Senate reform necessary? And if so, can it be done? In the process, he will summarize the previous attempts at reform and will make some concrete suggestions for future action. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gordon Barnhart for the 2014 Stapleford Lecture. Thank you very much, uh, Greg. And uh, I've said this before when I've been introduced for uh, speeches, but I will repeat it again tonight. When I hear that uh, description of my careers, it just kind of makes it sound as if I couldn't hold a job, doesn't it? <laughs> it's been a wonderful career so far, and it's uh, hopefully not over uh, yet. And uh, so, uh, good evening, uh, Madam President, and uh, uh, Sir President as well, uh, Stuart. Nice to see you here as well, and honored guests and friends and family of uh, Staplefords. And ladies and gentlemen, and what a nice audience this is. I recognize so many people in the audience. Uh, first off, from living in Regina on several occasions, but also uh, during my term as Lieutenant Governor. So, uh, a, a good welcome to all of you. I'm particularly honored to be invited to give this uh, talk tonight, uh, to be recognized by the University of Regina. And I was being very careful in making sure which university I was talking about. You know, I was told a story recently of a very special guest at the University of Calgary and it was an, uh, an honorary degree recipient speaking. And in the speech, at least five times, she made mention of receiving this from the University of Alberta. <laughs> and the audience was getting more and more uncomfortable. And afterwards, someone said, but this is the University of Calgary. Oh, are there two universities in Alberta? <laughs> So I am very well aware of the sensitivities between universities, but I think it's a good, healthy rivalry, and uh, I, I look forward to even greater cooperation uh, between the two universities, uh, and SIS too, and SIIT, in the uh, years, uh, years ahead. When I was invited to give this talk, I, and this was well over six months ago, I think, wasn't it, when we first started talking about this, and then I had to commit to a topic. And I thought, what am I going to talk about? Six months from now, what is going to be topical? <laughs> well, I said, you know what, I could talk about the Senate and Senate reform, but what happens if it's reformed in the meantime? Then I'll have lost my topic. <laughs> and I've breathed a sigh of relief. It's still there. And, uh, and it's pretty well its uh, uh, same form. And uh, so here goes in terms of some of my thoughts on the Senate. You know, Senate and talking about Senate reform, and those two words, Senate reform, is kind of like an oxymoron, isn't it? It uh, hasn't been happening. And it's kind of like the weather. Everybody talks about it, but nobody does anything about it. And uh, I'm going to conclude with a thought on that as well, where uh, the weather is changing, but the Senate isn't. But I think, I think that the Senate, especially as, as Greg mentioned in the introduction, with the recent scandals, the whole debate on residents and where people are living and what uh, allowances they can claim and travel allowances and, and all of that sort of thing has brought the Senate into the light even more than ever before. And you know, a good friend of mine who's in the media, must have been about six, eight months ago, he said to me, Gordon, he said, don't worry about it. The story doesn't have legs. It's not going to last long. And every time I see him, I say to him, so? How about the Senate? That story that doesn't have legs. 
It's an amazing story because have you noticed nearly every week there's a new angle, a new story, and it's new charges. Just recently we've had RCMP investigations and then charges, and from that we're then going to have court cases. Uh, we have the Auditor General doing the review and perhaps even more uh, cases that will perhaps come out of that uh, audit or that review, comprehensive audit as well. So I, I think that it's going to continue on for some time to come, as well as then the ruling by the Supreme Court on what their opinion is on Senate change. So I ask the question, why do you think that people are so upset about these scandals in the Senate? It seems that people are inordinately upset about it. And I, uh, no insult to you, Mr. Goodale, but I'm sure if, if someone in the House of Commons was doing the same sort of thing, people would be annoyed somewhat, but not to the same extent. And I think the reason is, if it's a member of the House of Commons, people can say, damn, I really disapprove of that. I'm going to vote against that person in <coughs> the next election. There's kind of that pressure release valve to say, I can do something about it. With the Senate, because each of the Senates being Pointed, there isn't that recourse to say, well, I'm going to vote against that person in the next election. And I think that is why there is that extra amount of angst or unhappiness whenever there is another scandal or another angle to the scandal with regard to the Senate. I think it's really just because they're appointed with no chance of having that election to correct that situation. I think there's another factor, and it rel relates to Senator Wallen and Senator Duffy. I don't know, and I'm not going to get into the details of their cases because each is slightly different and there are varying different accounts, and perhaps if it goes to court, more of the details will come out. But I think part of it is due to, first off, with Senator Wallen, I don't know how many young women have said to me, I am so disappointed because she was a role model for me, young women especially. She um, had a great career in the media. She, uh, when she got fired by the CBC, she had a great following. People took her side and felt very sympathetic towards her. She traveled the world, Canadian representative to the United States. And then the senator took on some interesting projects, and I think there was that great or uh, especially for young women to say, there's a role model for me, and when that came crashing down, there seemed to be an extraordinary feeling of disappointment. And with regard to Mr. Duffy, being also a member of the media, a media personality, he had developed a reputation as being the man that was fighting corruption in government on behalf of the common people. And then when he becomes part of it, I think again there was that sense of disappointment like, Darn, why is he involved with this sort of thing? There's a third part to why I think the Senate scandal, I hate using the word scandal, but I haven't thought of a better word, whereby I think the media itself is playing it along because there's a certain amount of disappointment on their part. Here are two key representatives from the media, Wallam and Duffy, who in many ways disappointed the media, and perhaps they're getting their own in terms of all of the coverage. That, that's just an outside theory, but uh, it may be another reason why the story just keeps going on. The story does have legs. The current Prime Minister, Stephen Harper, has made several proposals to change the Senate, and he first said he wasn't going to make appointments with patronage. He was going to wait and not uh, have change. But I think he realized that if, as the numbers, as senators were dying or retiring, he was either going to have to make appointments to get a majority in order to bring change. I think he also remembered one of his uh, predecessors, Joe Clark, who left vacancies in the Senate, was then defeated and didn't have a chance later to fill those vacancies. That was likely a factor as well. So once he had the majority, he proposed incremental changes, changing the length of service, to a senator, limiting it for, say, seven years or nine years, and that was open to debate, open to discussion. He also proposed that provinces would have elections as a way of uh, selecting uh, senators. <coughs> the province would make that selection, and then the prime minister would make a recommendation to the governor general that that person be appointed. 
And he argued that neither of those changes would require a constitutional amendment. The problem was, and I think his frustration has been, that in appointing senators and having them promise that yes, they were in favor of Senate reform, once they settled into their Senate offices, lost their appeal and their, uh, their fire for bringing about Senate reform. And I, I know the Prime Minister has felt very frustrated about that. And so now is waiting for a ruling from the Supreme Court. And I'm not just too sure when that's going to be, perhaps within the next 12 months. It seems that the Supreme Court will make a ruling on various issues with regard to Senate reform. One of the options that they will talk about is, is it going to require 50% plus 50% uh, of the population in seven provinces to bring a change? So in other words, you'd have to have at least Ontario and Quebec, a Ontario or Quebec, and other six provinces to make up half of the population of Canada. Or would it have to be unanimous, meaning all of the provinces, House of Commons and the Senate, agreeing to that change? Those uh, changes that I mentioned from the Prime Minister uh, has been argued that it wouldn't require constitutional change at all. But I think the whole topic now of Senate reform has been left until the Supreme Court makes its ruling. There was one change that's been made just recently, and Mr. Goodell and I were just talking about it tonight, that the uh, leader of the Liberals, Mr. Trudeau, has made a change in terms of saying that the senators in the Senate who were Senate Liberal senators are no longer part of the Liberal caucus, the National Caucus. And so we'll have to see how that change will play itself out in terms of does it ch make a change in terms of the organization of the Senate internally. It's an interesting thing though in terms of the Senate and our Constitution and our creation of Canada. In the first 95 years of the Senate's existence, there were five attempts at Senate reform. In the last approximately 51 years, there have been 17 attempts at Senate change, Senate reform. It's also an interesting thing to watch the history of it, that Senate reform tends to be cyclical and it comes up approximately every 10 years. <laughs> Watch that, and whether we'll get changed this time or not, I don't know, or it might be another 10 years. So with all of this constitutional talk, I thought I would just take you back to when this country was formed, the Fathers of Confederation, 1867. Interestingly enough, in that 1864 to 67 period of time, with the constitutional discussions on forming Canada, more than half of the time was spent on discussing the Senate and discussing what it would look like, what its powers would be, whether it be elected, whether it be appointed. And that was the crux of all of the discussions at that time, was what were they going to do with the Senate. And there was quite a bit of uh, support for elected Senates, uh, upper chambers, because the partners entering Confederation had upper chambers and were elected, but that was becoming less uh, of a popular mode and more like they wanted to have nominated or appointed senators. And so they looked to the House of Lords in the UK, and they looked to the Senate in the United States, for examples, both of whom had upper chambers that were appointed. Ha, ah, and you're saying, no, 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 whoa, the United States has elected senators. And they do, but they didn't in 1867. They were appointed. And so that was the model that the Fathers of Confederation in forming Canada looked at in terms of having um, appointed senators. The uh, Constitution um, took on a great life of its own in terms of the discussions about the Senate, what it was going to do. Quebec was the key component of all of that in terms of saying that the Senate was absolutely necessary to protect their language and their culture. They could see that the French language, people speaking French, would be very much in a minority, and even more so as time went on, as the <laughs> English population was increasing in Ontario and other provinces. And so the Senate became that cornerstone of ensuring ling linguistic and cultural rights for the Quebecois. And so Quebec agreed that they would have 24 seats. Why 24? in the tradition of Quebec at that time, and bear in mind that Quebec 
is just a long, slim piece along the St. Lawrence River in 1867. It was much, much later that it was expanded up into the Northwest Territories. There were 24 seats in that original section of Quebec, and so there are 24 seats in the Senate. And interestingly enough, even today, to be a senator, they don't, there aren't senators for all of Quebec. Each, 20, each of the 24 senators represents one of those small electoral districts within Quebec. And I remember hearing the discussion as one senator from Quebec was leaving and somebody else they knew were going to be appointed, they had to make sure that they had property, not within Quebec, but within that small one segment of the province of Quebec. But if Quebec got 24 seats, then of course Ontario got 24 seats. And again, Ontario was much smaller then than it is today. So then what to do with Atlantic Canada? Nova Scotia got 10, New Brunswick got 10, and PEI, when it joined, got four. Magically enough, it's 24. And when the West all became part of the formula, there are four Western provinces, each getting six seats. Guess what? It's another 24. So it all balances out until 1949, and Newfoundland spoiled it all by them getting six and didn't match any of the 24. <laughs> But that's how, and then we have the three territories, that adds up to 105. In 1867, the Senate was given the same powers as the House of Commons, with one exception. The Senate was not allowed to introduce money bills. In other words, introduce initiatives for the spending of money. But it had a full and absolute veto. Anything coming out of the House of Commons, the Senate could just plain say no. And that was, the, the bill would be dead. And that exists still today, with one exception, I'll talk about that in a moment. The senators had to be landowners. Of course, they were men at that time, because women didn't have the vote until roughly 1916 onward. So they had to own land, they had to be 30 years of age, and they had to have property worth $4,000. You can see how they were designing the Senate to be a sober second thought, a counterbalance to the House of Commons, which was elected. And bear in mind, too, in 1867, shortly after that, elections really were a fairly new concept. And people were saying, I don't know if we can really trust this whole concept of giving everybody the chance to choose who the government will be. I mean, look at that person over there. They have a vote. Would that be very sensible? We need to counterbalance this wild revolutionary idea of elections by having people who are appointed. A little older, 30 years old, property. They'd be more mature and be able to counterbalance that radical House of Commons. Interestingly enough, the first push for reform in the Senate came only seven years after Confederation. In 1874, one of the members of the House of Commons, David Mills, made the radical suggestion that the Senate needed to be reformed. He proposed that the provinces should select their own senators, but nothing ever happened to that solution, or to that proposal. In 1926, Robert McKay wrote a book entitled The Unreformed Senate. 1926. So we think this is a new idea. It's been around for quite a while. And no change happened with regard to that until 1965 when the retirement age, and I should have mentioned that when the Senate was created, the retirement age, it was an appointment for life. You, you died there. Uh, you could retire, but you, you could stay on as senator until you died. In 1965, that was changed so that the retirement age was 75, which is still the case today. In 1976, the government proposed <coughs> creating a House of Regions, where the provinces would have the power to select their senators, but again, that didn't pass. In 1982, the absolute veto, so I described to you what an absolute veto is, that they have the absolute power to say no to com anything coming from the House of Commons. They have the power to amend and send it back, or the absolute veto power. In 1982, that was changed so that they had suspensive veto, on any legislation concerning changes to the Senate. Otherwise, they still have absolute veto. And the only other change was as each new province was added to Confederation, there were new senators in terms of numbers added to the Senate. 
So there's a wee bit of a brief history of Senate reform, and I've only covered uh, a few of, as I said, the many different attempts. So what are the solutions, or what are the possible solutions? I think the first one is abolition. The NDP have argued that since its creation, and they don't have any members in the Senate. They had a chance once, uh, not that long ago. Senator Dick from Saskatchewan said she wished to sit as an NDP senator, and the party said no. And so she didn't then sit as NDP. So the NDP don't have any senators, and they've argued long and hard for years, decades, that they would like to see the upper chamber abolished. And they've been joined recently by Premier Wall, who also has made statements to say that he's given up on Senate change and that it should be abolished. I would suspect that with, if that ever became a serious proposal that was being discussed, I suspect that Quebec might resist that change, going back to its old argument of the protection of the region, to protection of culture and, and language, and thus would argue against having only just the House of Commons. Perhaps the Maritimes, Atlantic Canada, and the West too might argue that if there was only a House of Commons, what is going to counterbalance the huge number of people representing Ontario, it having the largest population, uh, and if Rep by Pop is to reign there, what would counterbalance that for the parts of the, pro parts of the country that don't have as many people? So those would be some of the arguments to say, let's not do abolition. The other part of that discussion is, what would be the formula to get that change if, in fact, they were going to go for abolition? And I mentioned earlier about the Supreme Court of Canada and its ruling. That is going to be part of what they're going to rule on, is what would be the formula, unanimous consent or the 750 rule to bring uh, abolition to the Senate. The second one would be type of reform to the Senate. In the 1970s and 80s, I mentioned, there was the whole pressure of the province of regions, or the house of provinces, where the senators would be chosen by their home provinces. And that died out. In 1984, there was a, a report by Molgrad, Molgad and Cosgrove, who made a recommendation, and I think it had some legs to it for quite a while, where they said that the Senate should be elected, it should be for a nine-year term, and a third of the Senate would come up for re-election every three years, and that you couldn't run again. So, Michael, if you were elected today, you would be there for nine years, and then you're done. But as that would be done, a third each, every three years, would be up for election. I don't think that the government of the day favored that, because it was as if you were going to have a by-election every three years. Mm -hmm. And those dates would be not on the dates of the elections for the House of Commons, because the fear would be if that happened, you might have a sweep going for the House of Commons, and that same sweep would bring in the same number of whatever party it might be for the House of Commons, and then the Senate. And so the government was not too keen on that whole idea of a nine-year term with re-elections every, or not re-elections, but elections every three years. The veto with regard to that reformed Senate that was proposed by Molgat and Cosgrove, um, it would the Senate would lose its absolute veto and have a suspensive veto of 120 days. So in other words, it could delay legislation for up to 120 days, but it didn't have the absolute control to say no. It had many advantages, and in fact, that's one of the ones that I've studied the most, I think, in terms of what some of the advantages perhaps were. First off, the proposal was that the senators would be nonpartisan. So I guess, uh, Mr. Goodale, that would be kind of what Mr. Trudeau is looking at today. The senators would sit in the chamber not representing parties necessarily, but they would be there more as independents. As I say, I don't think, though, the government of the day favored it because of the by-elections every three years. Greg mentioned a little earlier uh, the Triple E as another possible reform proposal. Equal, elected, and effective. It came out of Alberta particularly. Many people there were proposing it. Each province would get six senators, so that's the equal. 
They would still have absolute veto to some extent, but they would have a suspensive veto of 90 days on tax bills and 180 days on other matters. The larger provinces, of course, objected to that. Ontario and Quebec say, well, why would we go to only six seats? And Prince Edward Island, which has a population of less than Regina, would have the same number. And so there was some concern about the equal side of it as well. And yet, you know, interestingly enough, the United States has elected Senate. They have two senators for each state. And the state of California has more population than the country of Canada. Compared to North Dakota, it has a very sparse population, each having two. It, well, I was going to say it seems to work for them, but of the last couple of years, <laughs> I'm not sure I'm going to say that. Um, because there are certainly some uh, examples where I find it very frustrating to watch the American system and their bicameral Congress. But that was the Triple E. It lasted for a fair while. They even had the lapel pins and the whole bit. It was quite a campaign. But, as you know, it didn't succeed. 1987 was the Meech Lake Accord. And that was, I went to the Senate during that period of time. I went to the Senate, by the way, with a full head of hair. <laughs> and that's what they did to me. <laughs> and it was interesting, during the Meech Lake discussions, the Prime Minister of the day, Mr. Mulroney, agreed not to appoint any senators until a province held an election to choose which senator they wanted to have appointed. Once that election was done, the Prime Minister would then make that recommendation to the Governor General and the appointment would be made. And that did happen in Alberta where Stan Waters, in fact I swore him in when I was clerk of the Senate, and the media kept calling him the first elected senator. He was elected by Alberta, but it really didn't have much standing other than the fact that the Prime Minister then took that name and recommended Mr. Waters to the Governor General and he was appointed under the same process as every other senator has and ha is now being appointed. But as you know, Meech Lake failed, and I won't go into the history of all of that, but again, another interesting part of the history of our country. The next sequel to that, I guess, would be Charlottetown Accord. And I've called the proposal in the Charlottetown Accord with regard to the Senate a two and a half E Senate rather than a triple E. They proposed that it would be equal, it would be elected, but the effective part would be much reduced. In other words, they would not have the same number of powers that they now have. Charlottetown was a compromise. Do you remember all of that debate in the Charlottetown Accord? When I was teaching political studies, I spent a great amount of time talking about the Meech Lake Accord and the Charlottetown Accord. From an academic, it's a fascinating period of time, and, and it's, a, it's a graveyard that I don't think any Prime Minister wants to walk by now uh, in terms of uh, the, the political anguish of the time. But there were 62 points of compromise, and it was agreed to by all of the political parties, the unions, the provinces, the First Nations, and people would say, well, how can it not pass? And yet there was amongst the population some who were opposed and said, that they didn't like it. And the interesting thing about those 62 points, if you were opposed to the Charlottetown, all you had to do was find one point out of the 62 you didn't like, and you'd vote against it, right? But if you were defending the Charlottetown Accord and all 62 points, you had to defend all of the 62 points in order to get agreement. And so that was quite a mammoth task, and. I worked very hard while I was, I was in the Senate during that period of time as well, and it, at the beginning it looked like it was going to change, and so we were spending quite a bit of time getting ready for if the Senate was going to be reformed under Charlottetown, what it was going to look like, and how it was going to work, and all of that sort of thing. And I must admit that I was quite disappointed when it didn't, because I thought, here is our chance of getting Senate reform. It wasn't perfect, and they were going to make changes even after that. And we were living outside of Ottawa, and we had a flagpole and a Canadian flag. And the night that it didn't pass, I lowered the flag to half-mast. <laughs> and two weeks later, my wife said, Gordon, it's over. Put the flag up. <laughs> but I knew then that 
there wasn't going to be, I thought anyway, Senate change in my lifetime, and thus uh, my Senate days came to an end. And so the last one that I mentioned, I mentioned the two, Mr. Harper's proposals on change and the most recent by Mr. Trudeau, and we now await the Supreme Court in terms of what's the next step. So even though there's been great dissatisfaction and with the current Senate, I think the biggest problem is there's no consensus on what to do about it. I think if you took a poll, a great number of the people would say, yes, we have to have change. But then you start to break it down and someone will say, well, well we should abolish it. And others say, well, it should be elected. And some say it should be equal. And it, it goes on and on and on as to how are we going to get a consensus. And can you imagine if the, if the Supreme Court says seven provinces, 50% of the population, that's the easiest one. Can you imagine getting seven premiers that would agree just on that? With their legislatures agreeing, the House of Commons would have to agree, and the Senate would have to agree. So think that through. Each of the premiers that's in agreement is going to say, we are going to strengthen the regional representation from our area, which is going to take away power from me as premier, right? Because right now, the premiers are viewed in many ways as being regional representation, representatives. So the premiers might not be too inclined. And in fact, recently, when this has been discussed, uh, the premier of, I think it was Prince Edward Island, said, well, if we were to be in agreement, we would want to have some other compromises. And then you start to get back into the beach and the Charlottetown. And that's a slippery slope in its own right. But then you say, would the House of Commons agree to that? Well, the House of Commons, would, that, would they be really excited about having another chamber that would be now more powerful? Not more powerful in terms of constitutional power, but more powerful in terms of being more accepted because they'd be elected. Right now, the Senate has one of the biggest limitations on its power, constitutional power, is that they know that they're appointed and they don't represent the elected will of the people. And so how can they say no to the elected will on the House of Commons side when they're appointed? But if they were elected, they would have greater power in terms of counterbalancing the House of Commons. And I'm not sure the House of Commons would care for that as well. So then what about the Senate? Would the, the existing Senate agree to change so that they are no longer in their jobs? I see some nods going this way. I don't think they would, would they? So, what are our chances? I have 750. What are our chances of unanimous? Which would be even more difficult. So, I wait with bated breath in terms of seeing what the, what the uh, Supreme Court will say. So, if that is the difficulty of getting Senate change, Senate reform, is there any hope? And for now, it looks as if it's going to be very, very difficult to get any of those scenarios that I've outlined. And that leads us back to the status quo of where we're at at the moment. Now, I make an argument that there's one more option. I make the argument that it wouldn't require constitutional change at all. And it's an interesting proposal that I've been making to the media. The media, as perhaps you know, may, maybe to your boredom, have been interviewing me a lot about the Senate recently. Every time there's a new twist, they get a hold of me to see what my thoughts are on it. And I keep saying, there is one other option, and, and they ignore it. So this last time, and it was global, they said, we want an opinion from you on this. And I said, no, I'm not going to give you one. How come? I said, because I have a proposal for Senate change, and you just keep ignoring it. No, 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 we'll, we'll, we'll include it. What is it? OK, I'll do the interview. And here's what I'm proposing. This is just, just me. In the Senate right now, the policies on what claims can be made on expenses, travel, residence, interpretation of the law, interpretation of the Constitution, a lot of that is done by a committee called the Committee of Internal Economy, made up of senators. And they were making those decisions when I was there as clerk, and they still are today. And I was very, very frustrated with them because they would establish a policy. My role was then to implement the policy. And so 
Greg, you're a senator and you say, what is the policy? And the committee says, okay, this is the policy and you go ahead and do it. But Michael, another senator comes along and he goes to the internal economy and he says, the clerk is being really ma nasty to me and making, I have to follow that rule. Oh, Senator, you don't have to follow that rule. Here's another interpretation. And I think that's been getting them into a whole bunch of trouble and I wish they wouldn't do it. Because you can't have a set of rules that are interpreted one way one day, as Senator Wallen has been arguing, and whether all of that is true or not, I'm not judging. I don't know the, all the details. But you can't set rules and then expect people to follow them but make exceptions all of the time. And I make the argument, and interestingly enough, I'm backed up on this by Ken Dye, who was the Auditor General. Uh, and he made a report in 1991, and I admit he and I worked on this together. <laughs> the pen behind the scenes. Um, Ken Dye made the report, and he, he did a comprehensive audit way back in, in the early 90s. And interestingly enough, the media now is saying the current Auditor General is doing a uh, uh, an audit, and this is the first time, it's not the first time, there was one in the early 90s. And Ken Dye made the recommendation that the Committee of Internal Economy should set the rules, make sure they're clear, and then back away. And let the administration, the clerk, the chief financial officer, whoever is handling it, implement the rules. And for you, Senator, and you, Senator, and you, Senator, you all follow the same rules. And there will not be an exception. And to me, that seems logical. It seems like, now that's not going to change a lot of the Senate, but it would change all of the scandal. And the scandals are really coming because of misinterpretation or different interpretations of the rules of what they're allowed to claim. Some of it's maybe purposeful, that somebody is claiming something purposefully that they shouldn't, and perhaps a lot of it is just that they're making claims on a misinterpretation or different interpretation of the rules. I don't think that making that change would require a constitutional change, and I think it would get rid of a lot of the scandal idea and would take the Senate out of that whole maelstrom of controversy that would perhaps help them restore its proper use. The Senate does do some good work. The Senate has some committees, and they have been able to produce some good work, but it's far overshadowed by all of the problems that the Senate has had, and most recently, uh, the most current ones. And so, as I said at the very beginning, we say that Senate reform is like talking about the weather. Everybody talks about it, nobody does anything about it. The weather is changing but I don't think the Senate is, not for now. We'll just keep talking about it. Thank you very much. Now we have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes for questions, and I want to question you. <laughs> And uh, these are honestly questions. Please avoid long speeches. And uh, if you're going to give us a manifesto, keep it really short before you ask your question. Okay, so would, would you your... tell us who you are as well? Did Global run the story? <laughs> Thank you, Bob. I, I'm glad you asked that. I forgot to tell that part of it. We recorded it all, and no, they did. They ran the story on the part they wanted, but they didn't touch anything about my idea of Senator Foreman. <laughs> You've never had that happen, though, I'll bet. Please. Yes? Um, you made reference to the Americans starting out with uh, an appointed Senate and then moving to elected. Yep. Would you share some information about the circumstances that made them change, and do you see any parallels to our country? I should have known you were going to ask me that question. I don't know. I haven't really actually studied. <clears throat> I'm more on the Canadian side than the American, and so I'm, I'm not sure. Michael, are you familiar with that? No, I, I do, yes. I, I'm a Texan-American. Yes? And I'm, speak, speak up so everyone can hear. A Texan-American, he No, says. he says he's a Texan, not an American. Oh, not an American. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'm a professor of political science at Texas Tech University, where some of your football 
quarterback should come from. <laughs> I don't know if it was Ray Cup or not. <laughs> but in any case, uh, they were appointed by the legislatures. And so there was this popular movement of progressivism, as we call it, in the end of the 19th century, early part of the 20th century. And it was felt that the people ought to have the right to select their senators as opposed to a small group or a kleptocracy <laughs> appointing them. So uh, that happened, and now we're back to a kleptocracy <laughs> through the uh, matter of campaign financing, yeah. which really needs it. In Texas, uh, each legislator or senator member of the House or the National gets a fixed budget and then he or she can use it as how they wish for staffing and then for travel back to their constituency uh, at the national level two to three times a year and then the other times when they travel, and so many of them do travel on weekends, they use it from their campaign funds. Right. right. Uh, and is okay. Professor McIntosh here tonight from the Political Science Department? <laughs> I, I had talked with him on the phone sure. uh, yesterday about coming here. Well, thank you very much for that explanation. And I'm, I'm now educated, and I'm going to follow up on that even more. Uh, first off, on how you can be a Texan and not an American, but yeah. <laughs> please. You actually only listed a very small number of changes that have occurred in the Senate. Yeah. Is that the entire list? Yeah. <laughs> in all of our years since 1867, and yet, how many did I say there? Uh, 17 attempts in the last while. And there's really only been a couple of changes on the fringes. Yes, Michael. And then I'll go next up. Gordon, when you were clerk of the Senate, I remember visiting you in Ottawa at the time. Mm -hmm. I knew you were struggling with these issues. You were trying to get reforms through. Mm -hmm. um, do you feel that, like saying, I told you so? <laughs> and, I told you so, yes. And yeah. what reform, what were you trying to get, to get changed, which might have headed off that today's problems? Well, the Ken Dye report, uh, and it's, it's, well, I'm kind of a junkie on that, but uh, I, I think it's a, it's a good read in terms of what he was suggesting. And there are, I don't remember now how many changes were recommended, but all of the changes that were recommended in terms of what I could do as the administrator were done. The changes that were recommended in terms of changing what the senators would do, none of them, to my knowledge, none of them were done, and I doubt that they have been done since. The biggest frustration for me was that Committee of Internal Economy. Um, and the clerk has all the responsibility and none of the authority. And that's unworkable. You have to have authority and responsibility. And I would say the Committee of Internal Economy, ha I'm sorry, I get a little excited about this, but Internal Economy has to say to the clerk, these are the rules, and now it's your responsibility to enforce them. And if they're not enforced, we will have words with you as to why you're not doing your job. But it's not that, it's not, anyway, yeah, that was the biggest frustration. Wait back, please. Uh, it's not the problem with the uneven application. I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. Sorry, the Antimony Department of History. Yes? Um, the uh, problem with the unequal, or the, or the perceived unequal application of the rules is that not perhaps linked to the problem of regional diversity and the fact that uh, one senator uh, goes to the uh, Committee for Internal Economy and says, well, the rules that apply to that senator shouldn't apply to me because I, have, I come from a very special, different uh, part of the country. Is that not uh, one of the reasons for the, uh, for the, the apparent I don't, I don't think so, but I guess it could be. But I, I just think that it's just an inconsistency that's been built in, and, and 
I don't know. I guess I'm kind of black and white on this. It's either it's a rule and should be followed or, or not. And I think it should be followed. Was that, yes? Yeah. Um, I'm John Klein. With what's happened in, uh, in the Senate scandal so far, and do you think it's actually going to provide the spark that brings about the change? Like you mentioned, they didn't do any of your proposed changes. And I'd consider you a pretty powerful person in, in Canada. Uh, definitely, Thank you, but I'm not. Definitely, <laughs> definitely compared to how people may, may feel about their own uh, personal power in the country. And so if, if powerful people are not influencing these changes, uh, what hope do uh, people that don't feel connected to power really have to push this? And, and who can they talk to that will push this for them? Who, who are the powerful people interested in actually changing this? Well, very interesting uh, question, and thank you for your vote of confidence, except I don't really have any power. Um, <laughs> perhaps some influence, but not even with global in terms of their report. Um, I don't know how we're going to... The next auditor's report, which as you know is, is under being undertaken right now, and the media keep talking about it as they're investigating just those, you know, it's kind of like it's because of this scandal. I think it's it is rough, isn't it? It's, it's a comprehensive audit. I think they're going to look at the whole thing. And depending on what Auditor General Ferguson recommends, I have my fingers crossed that he may repeat the, the Ken Dye recommendations for change in terms of the Senate. But I don't know. I did send an email kind of with a subtle hint, but uh, I didn't get a response. Recommend them to who? Oh, it, it would be recommending it to the, to the Senate. It would be the Senate that would make those changes. But I think it's going to be public pressure and perhaps political pressure from the House of Commons, which would be within the three political parties, as well as public, and the public pressure will come that way as well. I think that's perhaps how that sort of change will come about. The constitutional change, oh, that's an open question. I don't know how that's going to come about. But yes, Lauren. Uh, well, part of the current malaise has been the allegation that the Commons has had undue influence over the workings of the Senate. When you look back historically, has that often been the case? Has it been unusual in the last 15 years, or how do you see that? Being several thousand kilometers away from it. Now, I'm not exactly sure in terms of how much, it, you know, you read about that in the press. I saw a major transformation of the Senate, though, while I was there. When I first started with the Senate, the Senate was, to use that broad expression, an old boys club, even though there were women there. It was very much, um, the Speaker didn't have much influence or authority. Uh, in the House of Commons, if a member of the House of Commons wants to speak, they address the speaker and they speak through the speaker, and the speaker recognizes who will speak. In the Senate, it was more, um, well, the Senate speaker is an appointment by the Prime Minister, not a choice by the Senate, and that reduces the power of the Senate, uh, of the speaker. But then secondly, there is that whole issue of are they really going to follow the rules? When I first started in the Senate, there was no adjournment time, no specific time for adjournment at the end of the day. It was just, oh, well, honorable senators, perhaps it's time now for us to, to quit and go and have a, a bit of scotch or something like that. And they would adjourn. Um, and the change overcame with GST. And that was when I really lost my hair, um, was, uh, that was a horrendous five weeks, I think it was. Uh, it seemed like five years. But there was a whole controversy within the Senate over the passage of GST. And um, the old gentleman's club ended. And it became far more partisan between the parties than, than, than it had been before. So I really saw that change. What's happening now, I'm only reading from afar, um, so I can't really comment on if it's any better or worse.